We're here with uh, Jameson Webster and Marcus Cohen. You both are psychoanalysts, Lacanian, I think. Uh, where you said uh, that maybe you weren't too dogmatic about the whole thing. Right? Okay, Freudian. yeah, there you go. <laughs> so you have a German, a Mexican, a British, and an American. We do. Yeah. And uh, yeah, we're we're gonna talk about. Well, Jameson had this idea that we should talk about. Casavetti's film called uh, uh, One Woman Under the Influence. So we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. And uh, what did you what, what did you think about that? Well, I, I've just been so intrigued by the idea of history. I think I've said to Jameson a number of times, um, as I have kind of had more of an interest in the idea of obsession, because I think I'm maybe an obsessive myself. <laughs> and psychosis oh, yeah. things like, oh, really? <laughs> I mean, this is the thing, it's like when you're, whenever I'm with like a psychoanalyst, I'm like, please diagnose me. Although you, you go to the Canadian psychoanalyst, a psychoanalysis in your... I've so. asked him to tell me, so like, what do you think? So what do you think I am? And he won't tell me, which is probably the best, because I might just... like. not my patient. We see, would, you, <laughs> would you ever tell your patient what you think they are? No. no. Um, is that, why won't you, why won't you do it? Is it different for every analyst? Like they just, they might say or not? Or? I think some do. Mm -hmm. Even the Kenyans do. Really? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. There are some that, that give little hints. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, they would tell a story, you know, about an obsessional man. And then as a hint that that could be the patient. I've, I've heard this. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's interesting. And I guess you you have an interest in conversion disorder, the mm -hmm. idea of kind of illness. Mm -hmm. hi, hi, would you call it a hypochondria? No, well, the conversion disorder in the the DSM is a certain kind of somatic symptom problem, but I like it just as a remnant of mm -hmm. the old Freudian definition of hysteria, which mm -hmm. essentially is a problem of conversion, that there was something going on in the body of the hysteric, and that since hysteria isn't in the DSM anymore, this is like the last trace of it. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I just like the, the words conversion disorder. I think it's, yeah. Like there's something touching about it. It is interesting. A few people have asked, we were at this uh, weight conference currently, you know, the connotations of various words for mm -hmm. psychoanalysis that they could be seen as problematic or offensive or whatever. But of course, you know, the original meaning is something quite concrete and specific mm -hmm. and useful. So, yeah. Have you been a part of a... At a conference that is more that has more of a religious edge to it, or is this the first time? Well, this is the first time that it's specifically people who exist within various forms of institutional religion. I mean, it's not as if theology isn't a huge part of like many academic contexts that I've been in. And um, there's a long tradition in Lacanian psychoanalysis of an interest in mysticism mm -hmm. because the mystics were these kind of bodily hysterics. Mm -hmm. and, Um, the more they went into their kind of mystical visions, the more they were having these bodily symptoms mm -hmm. and um, crazy, almost sexual experiences. So, uh, and that deeply informed Lacan when he talked about what he called um, female jouissance, mm -hmm. that there was this kind of unbounded sexual mystical experience that, um, you know, could, have, could undo people mm -hmm. in a way that might be important or might be out of, you know, might be sort of out of control. Mm -hmm. uh, But I would have to say it was pretty academic in the places in which I've encountered it. You? No, I've never... I mean, this kind of combination of, of psychoanalysis and, and theology, mm -hmm. I'm like systematic thinking through of mm -hmm. the question of God and dogmatism, I've never... I think I've never witnessed. I mean, I know that it exists, but... Like, or, but mm -hmm. So it's a, a weird one to explain to people who aren't involved in what it is <laughs> or what Peter's trying to do with it. It's, uh, it seems very strange. Mm. To some yeah. people, it seems like highly evangelical or religious. And then... Well, I'm I'm really, I mean, I have to say, I'm, I'm incredibly moved. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I said when I gave the talk, I said, I, I don't... I with My mind is blown that there's mm -hmm. these people engaging with Lacanian psychoanalysis who are trying to figure out why they had a relationship to God and mm -hmm. what this means for them now and what this might mean about what we can say to one another mm -hmm. in a communal form. So I was like, what? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, is, it is kind of, you know, and I think you, we're engaging with Todd's work as well because Todd is using psychoanalytic ideas like mm -hmm. Marx, Frege, Frege, Freud, Hegel, you know, and implying it to... I love Frege. Frege. Frege is my favorite <laughs> breakfast cereal. I feel like there should be a breakfast cereal called Frege. Um, But like applying it to kind of uh, psychoanal psychoanalyzing societal structures, and that's obviously mm -hmm. something different from being a psychoanalyst. Being a psychoanalyst, yeah. but 
I think it's interesting. Yeah. But Lacan was very influenced by uh, Luther, right? And like the whole Protestant thing. And, you know, he also wrote a few books on, well, the triumph of religion. And even though when I read it, I just felt like he didn't really talk about religion too much. Mm-hmm. But do you, what do you think about like the influence that religion had on, on Lacan? Do you want to talk about this? I mean, there is the, in this background, there is the story of his uh, Catholicism. Mm-hmm. You know, that was very, I mean, he came from a very traditional French Catholic family. And I think, you know, at the time it really meant something, you know, it really meant to live, to live in, a, in a very strict religious context. Yeah. Um, so that's very prominent. I mean, there is um, there are certain terms in Lacanian psychoanalysis that lend themselves to be misunderstood or understood mm-hmm. as quasi-religious terms. Things the like Santom and stuff. No, mm-hmm. the first being the Big Other. Okay, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the name of the, the name father. Of the name of the father. father. Yeah, yeah the that's father true. Is, yeah, you know, it's a biblical term. Yeah, right? yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, um, he has a trinity. The yeah, he has a trinity. Yeah. Yeah. symbolic and real. Yeah. 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 That's true. Yeah. So it's, uh, I think, and I think there are various positions on this, what actually his relation to religion mm-hmm. is. Mm-hmm. I mean, a lot is constructed around his saying that God is not dead, mm-hmm. but unconscious. We mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. probably talked about this. Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Um, but this can go, you know, many different ways. Mm-hmm. And there's, I mean, there is a tradition of ex-priests becoming Lacanian. Really? Uh, the, yeah, the, probably the first Lacanian in an American uh-huh. sense was someone named Bill Richardson, uh-huh. who was a priest, a Jesuit priest, and went to see Lacan. Uh-huh. Somehow, I don't know how he picked up uh-huh. on, on it, and then came back and was one of the first people to teach Lacan. So, really? Um, there's another priest in New York named Ed Robinson. He's one of the first Lacanians mm-hmm. in New York, also an ex-priest. And I think there's been a lot of... It, you don't know whether they're Catholic or they're ex-Catholic, mm-hmm. but they've been... They use Lacan in some mm-hmm. way to, to further whatever their mm-hmm. religious thinking was or is. It's interesting because uh, I think... Todd was talking about this yesterday, and Peter's kind of reading of Christianity is like the atheistic core, you know, that the, the cross is a symbol of like a nothingness and, and no big other, and that Christianity yeah, as, as a religion is really something that inside it has some kind of like no, similar notion perhaps that there's some kind of, I don't know, <laughs> No cure, cure, or no answer, or no answer, yeah, answer. no answer, answer. Um, but yeah, but talking about it, talking about religion, and talking about what you touched on, um, the kind of the idea of the hysteric women, women in uh, certain religious connotations, like nuns and things like. I don't know, you know, uh, there's a film that Aldous Huxley made about the. Uh, I can't remember the name of the film, but about um, a happening, at the time of Cardinal Richelieu in France, where women. Um, I, I watched a French documentary about this, a historical documentary, where uh, a very handsome uh, priest arrived in a certain area of France and it set these, I don't know if it was him or he, he had various relationships with these nuns and then this happening of mystical, the, the mystical hysteria happened. <laughs> and it went on for a long time. You even had like people from other countries visiting it as tourists and like whether people then kind of egged each other on as like, you know, as a performance, but it was a real kind of outburst. Um, I don't, I'm not very good at history and I can't even, I don't even know the specific date, but it was, you know, a phenomenon that seems to, especially from the Middle Ages and stuff. But I mean, you were saying as well that um, we're really as neurotic as ever and that uh, hysteria is alive and well. Sure. I yeah. Think it's, I think it's very alive and well. I mean, some people could think of, on the one hand, these kinds of alt-right phenomena mm-hmm. as hysterical. I mm-hmm. think that was talked a lot about in this conference to the extent that there's this dissatisfaction and this demand that they're putting onto the world mm-hmm. that is deeply embedded in questions about sex and gender. Mm-hmm. So you have the alt-right masculinity phenomenon, and then you have the Me Too mm-hmm. feminine phenomenon, mm-hmm. and then you also now have this hysterical kind of sexual war mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. kind of at play. And, and then I think, you know, and, and this is not a pejorative. So to mm-hmm. say that it's hysterical is not a pejorative. Yeah. Anyone who knows my work, it's like a valorization mm-hmm. of, 
um, kind of this way of insisting on a question in the world about mm-hmm. sex and gender. Um, it just needs to meet with certain conditions that turn it into something fruitful mm-hmm. as opposed to suffering or group phenomena. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, also the whole question of trans and uh, gender identity becoming multiplied into 77, mm-hmm. you know, whatever mm-hmm. categories yeah. on Facebook. I mean, these are all de- also deeply hysterical yeah. questions. Yeah. About, you know, do I have to have the body of a woman to be called a woman? Yeah. I mean, this is kind of amazing. Like, <laughs> no, you don't. But it's really yeah. interesting that you want to insist in this, this way question, on, yeah. on, on this question. So I think we're in very hysterical times. And um, the wellness industry seems mm-hmm. to be entirely histrionic. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I think the whole group thing, you mentioned it earlier, is just like, I actually am uh, planning a film at the moment. Uh, it's like a murder mystery set in a... Um, in a, a place where people extract themselves from society because they're like allergic to electricity and allergic. there's a place I actually watched a short documentary on YouTube about it called actually called Snowflake mm-hmm. Arizona and that's the name of the town as in it was named by Mr. Snow and Mr. Flake 200 years ago mm-hmm. and it happens to be this place where people have extracted themselves to mm-hmm. um, this was the Todd Haynes that was my second suggestion oh, of yeah. Women Under Influence but the movie Safe with Julianne Moore where yeah. she um, also goes into one of these communes where mm-hmm. they're trying to get away from toxins and pollution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just, I mean, this movie's old. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, we're like in the heyday of like, you know, this kind of hysteria mm-hmm. about toxins, which doesn't mean that there aren't toxins and pollutants. Mm-hmm. But, yeah, absolutely. Um, she like, you know, how far she has to mm-hmm. remove herself. Mm-hmm. And there's this amazing moment at the end of the movie. It's really stunning where, you know, her family's like, please come back to us. And she's like, wants to be in the bubble and this mm-hmm. like, kind of crazy community. And they have a discourse, you know, about how, how you're not safe mm-hmm. and how, you know, these toxins are everywhere and we have to really protect ourselves. Mm-hmm. And she's having this complete breakdown, this almost like, you know, this, this breakdown of having removed herself completely from her life. And, you know, Julianne Moore's face is so incredible and her use mm-hmm. of language is so powerful she repeats the the doctrine mm-hmm. of the weird community that she's in, but it mm-hmm. comes out in this sputtering fragments of nothingness, mm-hmm. and then, like, the film ends. Um, I have to, I have to push it, yeah. When you're talking about this sort of, like, hysterical position that is, is fragmenting the, the whole landscape of, like, the amount of genders, mm-hmm. what do you think about Zizek's proposition that you can be a plus directly. I don't know if you've heard him talk about that. So you have the LGBTQ plus. Right. And it's not about, because it'll never be enough. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter if there's 77 or more mm-hmm. or less. Like standing for multiplicity itself directly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that's the, they don't, you know, you would say in the same way that you say the hysteric doesn't know what she knows or doesn't even know mm-hmm. what she's asking for. Mm-hmm. But that, you know, rather than think, okay, well, I want this name for myself put onto the list that mm-hmm. they are for the, the plus. And the, mm-hmm. the plus is important. The plus mm-hmm. is about heterogeneity and multiplicity, mm-hmm. period. And then you can ask the question, like, does having all of those pluses on Facebook amount to a real plus? But you have to get closer to the side of what she's asking mm-hmm. for in order to have that be a fruitful mm-hmm. conversation rather than just putting one more thing mm-hmm. on the list of accumulation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, well, you... No, I was just thinking about the... the plus and hysteria and um, still thinking about what you said before in the question of hysteria today and what is helpful with Christian hysterics or Christian mystics mm-hmm. is that they um, like any other hysteric live really in their body mm-hmm. the rejection and the submission at the same time mm-hmm. to the, the system they are, they are in mm-hmm. um, but in a very unified and canonic form mm-hmm. and the confusion today is i think where which also i think is behind the i mean uh, many forces behind the disappearance of hysteria and the dsm mm-hmm. um but i think one of the reasons is also that uh, uh, hysteria is less unified mm-hmm. it's completely scattered Stratted, yeah because the big other if you wish mm-hmm. is scattered, it's scattered also, yeah you know? yeah so uh, mm-hmm. but that doesn't mean that the the very phenomenon of hysteria is mm-hmm. still the same. I think yeah, 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 yeah. the idea of conversion disorder is very fruitful yeah. because it just you know generalizes mm-hmm. the hysteric mechanism and could take on many, many forms. Because this is something interesting about the, the film, A Woman Under the Influence, that to me, I, when we were talking about symptoms earlier, that like symptoms are so disparate and can be signifiers of so many different things. And I feel like if you saw this film and this character 
just you know one might confuse it for psychosis or something but then actually uh, but this idea that the splitting of a kind of a disparate big other that symptoms take on so we were in this we were this free unfree world at the moment <laughs> where yeah we kind of we have our own particularities mm-hmm. it's almost like the dsm as well this it's like it's like the lgbtq plus 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 these attempts to codify mm-hmm. so many th- different things it's a, a, yeah. it a reaction to this theory. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. you could construct it in a certain way that the whole DSM, I mean, as I said, it has many forces. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. it's, you know, the pharmaceutical one, I mean, as everybody knows, mm-hmm. the, the major ones, but mm-hmm. the, the, the way of thinking is a reaction to this theory, mm-hmm. actually. The thing yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like yeah. Kind of cutting it into small pieces. Whereas, I guess, so, uh, psychoanalysis would be um, in dialogue with hysteria and asking questions of hysteria. Mm. I mean, it's true that the one of the great things about the movie A Woman Under the Influence is like certainly you want to say this is a you want to say this is a woman who's schizophrenic mm-hmm. or psychotic. But I think there's moments in the film in which I mean you could say that then they they give you the particularity of psychosis, mm-hmm. but I think it's more ambiguous. I mean, she's mm-hmm. an alcoholic. Yeah, she sleeps with all these people mm-hmm. the minute that her husband's Husbandly, gone. Yeah. She's a bored housewife. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She's histrionic to the extent that she can't help but like seduce yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody. everybody. She's got the hysterical giggles. Yeah, all the yeah, time. yeah, yeah. There's that beautiful scene in which she, you know, you, you and I talked about mm-hmm. this before. The Swan Lake, so the, the like the kind of rigid authoritarian like neighborly father shows yeah. up, and she has all the kids die in the Swan Lake moment in front of him, and she's like, "They're dying for you. What's the matter with you?" Um, you know, she's unbelievably tender yeah, with her yeah, children. There's yeah. like this beautiful tenderness with her mm-hmm. children. And she loves her husband. I mean, yeah, she loves yeah, she does. Man. Yeah. Um, and they're they're incredibly in, a, in this amazing, passionate relationship mm-hmm. with one another. And, you know, at the moment in which her symptoms go away, mm-hmm. like once she's been institutionalized and he desperately wants them back and he's mm-hmm. like, where are you? Where are you? Um, there's something really beautiful about mm-hmm. that that makes it a, a, a love story that's mm-hmm. beyond psychosis yeah, or beyond yeah. a sort of depiction of psychosis yeah. and just maybe female madness like across the spectrum yeah I wonder if you both could talk about to explain hysteria in the context of psychoanalysis because I think it can be easily misunderstood for example you have like the, the two different sides of like people will understand uh a psychotic person and maybe confuse it with a psychopath mm-hmm. like you know you have like this sort of like culturalization of, of, of psycho like from I don't know books like John Ronson or whatever but what would you get how would you guys explain sort of like the valences of a hysteric person I wouldn't call I mean you we say this also sometimes hysteric person but I don't think it's a, a good way of saying it. Okay. I think hysteria is not an attribute of a person. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think uh, I mean, Lacan would have called it a structure yeah. mm-hmm. in the very general sense. So um, there's not someone who's hysteric, mm-hmm. really. I think there's a structure in which someone is hysteric. Mm-hmm. That structure might be that person's life, so there's no outside of it. So in that sense, you know, uh, everything about her or him would be hysteric. But it's it's um, also, that structure, I think, hysteria that shows the fact that for psychoanalysis you can only understand things in structural terms mm-hmm. because the hysteric is fundamentally in relation to mm-hmm, the other. Mm-hmm, That's mm-hmm. actually the structure mm-hmm. with her body completely subjected and in resistance to mm-hmm. uh, the other. Whereas the um, so it shows something. The hysteric shows something about the structuralist understanding of the psyche if mm-hmm. you wish in general whereas the obsessional mm-hmm. always pretends not to be in the structure yeah you know, yeah, yeah. control the structure sure and the itself, yeah yeah and yeah in a certain way it also shows mm-hmm. you know so there is some kind of a protection from structure mm-hmm. in, in the obsessionality um so in, in that sense it's uh it's a very specific use of the, the term uh, hysteria i'm just this is our super Amazing. It's still going. We have this terrible, ter- my terrible laptop. Right. So I have it to keep intervening with it. Yeah. goes into sleep mode. But we, yeah. we were just, uh, I will do anything not to go to uh, the Apple store. You don't think that's to really <laughs> think the enigma of, of what psychoanalysis mm-hmm. deals with. Mm-hmm. Because um, the hysteric gives uh, her or his body mm-hmm. 
it's not a pretense, not you know, it's not an illusion that these symptoms occur. Yeah. yeah. But still, yeah, it can be understood as a structure. Mm -hmm. So it's, if if you really had a completely social phenomenon mm -hmm. and a completely physical phenomenon, you can do both explanations, but they come together, and it is fundamentally enigmatic mm -hmm. actually mm -hmm. what that mechanism is that would translate mm -hmm. the one into the other and the psychoanalysis is not there to explain explain yeah but to like, expose I the, yeah. Uh, yeah and that's why the i mean not just the kind of the what you were alluding to when there is this you know priest who shows up and creates hysterical women mm -hmm. and they all start traveling to the town but i mean the story has always been this this hysterical contagion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something yeah, yeah. Contagious about Absolutely, yeah. hysteria and like the boarding school phenomenon. Yeah. That, you know, one little girl starts coughing mm -hmm. and then all the little girls mm -hmm. start coughing. Mm -hmm. and, and the mystery of this. Yeah. It's interesting because. Um, and the, the, it's not like you want to say to them, okay, well, obviously you guys are all coughing together. Could yeah. you stop? But it's not that you Yeah, no, you can't. Because this is really <laughs> the, like where, where the illness starts, really, the very oh, yeah. how real it is. Because just as we have the phenomena like goop and the wellness industry um, at the moment, I am actually really intrigued by um, there's a whole movement of, you know, this the idea of like ME. And chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a big kind of like Emmy rights movement online. There's a documentary that came out that was shared at Sundance called Unrest a couple of years ago. It was a very good and moving documentary and kind of exposing the, the lives of all these people who live outside, you know, who live inside but outside society and that, you know, looking for a cure and that there's something that we just don't know about. Um, and it does address the idea of hysteria, but obviously in the kind of conventional, like, oh, hysteria misogyny bad you know mm. duh. but you know it is interesting <laughs> in that they of course are highly likely there are many illnesses that we don't know about mm. that we could find and cure a lot of these people but there's always going to be something about it that eludes us as well as part of it and then there's also a within the structure of what this thing is something that's not just medical right yeah but that's also what marcus is um alluding to mm -hmm. is the fact that she puts her body on the line and mm -hmm. the problem is when the structure answers it so she puts her body on the line let's say to ask a question about what how i mean a typically hysterical question would be how is a body productive mm -hmm. you know i have a female body my body creates mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. creative can create babies but you want it to work and be productive i'm a little confused about this yeah i'm really tired all of a sudden mm -hmm. <laughs> let's, just, let's just say that's how that is yeah, yeah. question gets yeah. exposed it's not that this question that she's asking about who am i as a woman who can produce mm -hmm. gets answered she gets whatever she gets mm -hmm. pills she gets gwyneth paltrow mm -hmm. she gets you know all kinds of mm -hmm. other things and this is this is you know this is the hysterical conundrum mm -hmm. is that the hysterical body and the social structure are in this relationship mm -hmm. where they're gonna they're gonna undo each other. Yeah. She's gonna undo herself, and this industry is going to explode, but also collapse because at a certain point she's gonna be pissed off that this isn't actually answering yeah. the question yeah. that she's trying to answer. So this kind of amazing tension. Yeah. I have a question about uh, the historical structure. Is I've often heard that. So the position of the hysteric, hysterics discourse in relation to the master is to be sort of just like demanding um, things from the master and from the master discourse and just trying to poke holes into it and to it's like it's finding inconsistencies in his discourse. But I've also heard that you know, hysteric is just wants to please the master. Mm -hmm. um, is this contradictory? Is it dialectical? There's like you find one through the other, or what would you guys say about that? I think it, I don't know, I don't want to give a coherent picture of these uh, lines. I think it shows different uh, aspects of, of what hysteria is. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, I would refrain from saying this like in general terms, that this mm -hmm. term wants to please the master. I don't I'm, I don't. That can happen, mm -hmm. um, but I mean, maybe, I the, maybe you maybe, translate it better into. I know. I mean, I think Marcus and I are a little exhausted of like this He's whole so the tired. hysterics running around the street looking for a master, and she's going to be a bigger master than the master, and then she's you know just as phallic as he is, and then we're in the same phallic. I mean, like we know all of this, mm -hmm. and it's not that it hasn't been important or is a part of of Lacan's discourse, but I think maybe one way to reframe it is just to say that she. 
she presents the mystery of transference. Mm-hmm. And the what transference is, again, is a relationship to the other and a playing out of all of the kind of varieties of experience that one has mm-hmm. in bringing a fantasy, bringing your body, bringing desire and expectation into a relationship, which on the one hand, maybe you want to fill the other up. Maybe you want to be the perfect object for them. Maybe mm-hmm. you want them to be the perfect object for you. Maybe you want them to teach you. Maybe you want to teach them a lesson. But I mean, you know, the what's nice for us about being psychoanalysts is it's not just this kind of trope that I think it sometimes turned into for Lacanians, but the absolute specificity of that fantasy and that you need a hysterical mm-hmm. transferential relationship in order to get that. So one of the things that I did recently that surprised me was um, for this magazine called Apology with my friend Jesse Pearson, who used to be part of Vice and Apology is this apology for Vice. <laughs> Um, you know, he said like, what's, he's doing something, he was doing an issue on fantasy and he said like, what would you bring to it as an analyst? And I said, well, this, this like kind of crazy idea in psychoanalysis that everyone has a masturbation fantasy, Mm -hmm. which is like the masturbation fantasy is how you play out your transference. Um, and like psychoanalysis has to get your masturbation fantasy. So is the masturbation fantasy the thing that you actually do when you're jerking Mm -hmm. off or is it this like deep unconscious, like strange phantasmatic Lacanian structure that it's sometimes talked about to be, or what's the relationship between the two? And he's like, cool. He's like, should we go get some masturbation fantasies? And I was like, good luck. And, you know, he, at first he thought like he would do Craigslist, but, you know, we knew that we would just get schlock if we did that. So he went and he found friends who were, you know, brilliant people, writers, whatever, interesting people. And he said, I'm going to anonymize these, but I need like a real masturbation fantasy. <laughs> um, it was really hard for him, of course, to get them. We thought, yeah. he, thought he thought he'd get like 40, yeah. you know, we'd like yeah. play around with these. He only got five. <laughs> yeah. Wow. But these five fantasies are incredible. And I like I was actually like the signifier is at play in yeah. them in a way that surprised me. Yeah. And each fantasy is trying to answer certain questions about what a man is, what a woman yeah. is, what intercourse is, yeah. what authority is, and each one puts all of the pieces there yeah. and creates an answer to it. Yeah. And you hear, I mean, you can see, you can imagine what this person would do in analysis, how their masturbatory fantasy would be the kind of structuring, playing out thing that yeah. you would analyze over the course of analysis. And I, I couldn't believe that you could get this out of people. Because people, I mean, don't share this stuff with anybody, no. not even their partner or anything like that. Because no. you know, like the idea of, um, I feel like Freud is often misunderstood as somebody who's like, oh, it's all about sex, but the whole thing is it's like, it's not. It's like almost the opposite of that. It's like humans can't have sex and like you have to close your eyes. You can't like actually have sex, you know. You have to like have this imaginary thing like avoiding actually having sex. But so with this, you were talking about, is this like these fantasies, they imagine like the phallic stage when your parents are kind of giving you dancing around the answer of all these questions (laughs) that you have as a child and you just create this kind of unconscious. It's like a dream like, condensation of things that you've heard and things that you've seen and things that you've thought that somehow like crystallizes and I mean you know as psychoanalysts like does it exist or does it not I don't even think we can even say Mm -hmm. at the moment it exists it doesn't Mm -hmm. you know like it just existed then you Mm -hmm. know was it always there who knows but um, you know I got one of the fantasies one of the the heterosexual male fantasies was of a woman on all fours in black pantyhose and a mm-hmm. white bra mm-hmm. and he would rip the pantyhose on her ass and then she would fart and she would <laughs> fart really really loudly and like no, he's like he's like this is really embarrassing i don't know but this is my <laughs> masturbation fantasy but what's amazing is that the ripping of the stockings is also the ripping of the farting i mean <laughs> you can't you can't make that up. you can't and also, you know, it's a prim- it's, it's a primal scene fantasy. It's not yeah, like, yeah, like yeah. the hearing your parents fucking is turned yeah. into this ridiculous <laughs> thing, yeah. anal thing, which yeah. is probably comforting. You know, like yeah. oh, they're not fucking; she's farting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> it's, always, it's so farcical. A friend of ours is a comedian who um, basically admitted what his fantasy is, and it was like. To because he was interviewing this like he he does is a host on a TV show and he was interviewing he's this really famous Olivia Munn he's just like really attractive mm-hmm. and he was realizing that as he was talking to her that he was having this fantasy of shitting in her eyes mm-hmm. 
<laughs> it's just so... Oh, it, fuck. Yeah. It's like, it's absolutely... It's got nothing to do with sex. But that's in the Ratman case. The Ratman in Freud... It? Yeah, he, it's in the notes, right? It's yeah. not in the actual yeah. case itself. Yeah. The Ratman sees Anna Freud, I think, or <laughs> Freud, one of Freud's daughters coming down the stairs, and right. then he has a dream about her having shit for eyes. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I don't remember exactly the detail. But yeah. Yes. Yeah. It's exactly the same. Yeah. We were talking yesterday about sort of like this the beauty standards of today and just trying to be like body inclusive or body positive. And we were just thinking, like, does it even make sense? Because do these things really accommodate people's relationships? Like, do we choose our partners based on the standards of beauty that are imposed on us from like magazines or just movie or whatever? Isn't it more just based on personal fantasy? Like, isn't fetish the thing that brings us to the person that we love eventually? And it kind of cuts through the bullshit of, like, you know, beauty standards or whatever? Enigma? Hmm. Um, tendentially, I would, you know, base the analytic work, I think, you know, on the hypothesis that there is something extremely specific and uh, irreducible and not standardized mm-hmm. that you're trying to find that you know would be the the little object that makes uh, makes a relationship bind or mm-hmm. You know. mm-hmm. but that's a hypothesis mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know it's a working and then i don't i think often you don't find that yeah and uh, it's also not excluded that uh, the very um outsideness of the standardized beauty does become that object. Mm-hmm. I, I think it's completely possible. Yeah. yeah, but also, I mean, I guess if you widen the view of so that you know body positive, different bodies, etc. Mm-hmm. I guess maybe you make the person less ashamed of of desiring yeah. what they desire. Mm-hmm. I, mean, I guess yeah. that that would be the hope. Yeah, I don't know because I think we're always going to be shamed, ashamed of what we desire, whether we're told that it's okay yeah. or yeah. not. I just think yeah. the experience of desiring is deeply shameful. Yeah, right. exactly. Um, yeah. But I'm not going to knock them. You yeah. know, they can, I'm happy for anyone to try to help anyone with their shame in whatever way they think that they yeah. can. <laughs> no, it's, it's profoundly embarrassing to kind of admit what you desire. Yeah, yeah, I, mean, I think just yeah. to even experience it is yeah. horrifying. It's horrifying, yeah, no, absolutely. And hard. Yeah. Is it just encoded into desire, the shame of it? Like, would you not, would you stop desiring it if it wasn't so shameful? I mean, Freud, you know, Freud at, at, at his best when he has footnotes, mm-hmm, when he becomes mm-hmm. extremely concrete. Yeah. Uh, I don't know what text it is, but it's a, a speculation about, um, I think also about beauty and also about shame and um, the genitals. And uh, it's, a, you know, in relation to the question of, you know, everything is sex and nothing is sex, um, it's a c- strange reversal because you would think he explains with the genitals all the rest. Mm-hmm. But in this footnote, he does the opposite. He's mm-hmm. saying, what, what is actually the problem with the genitals? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And he says, yeah, the, well, the problem with the genitals is they don't fit. Mm-hmm. They don't fit into the, into the rest of the body. Mm-hmm. There's somehow this strange part where skin is folded differently, mm-hmm. where other colors occur, mm-hmm. their closeness to... Um, he also says they're ugly. And they're ugly. It's almost it's interesting, it's interesting that, like, you know... So, yeah. It's just interesting in, sci- in sci-fi movies, you know, the, the monsters always look so, like, genitals, like yes. an alien, oh, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've said that. You said yeah, they do. I mean, it's like, it just, yeah. But the bodies are just ugly. It's, you're much better off, like... Yeah, and they're always somebody. like they're always gooey, and gooey and phallic, or like in Alien. There's both, uh, especially now the most recent films like Prometheus and stuff. Like there's the female version and the male version, and yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. but they are they're like alien. Yeah, yeah, yeah they are alien. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah you have the penis like it moves without you doing anything. anything. Yeah, it's this is like crazy. crazy. I mean, actually, Love Calm was the yeah. one who pointed out that the experience of having an erection is terrifying. Yeah, I mean, it's fun. It is something that, like, everyone's like, oh, the vagina is so scary. It's a hole. What the hell's going yeah. on? And blood comes out of it. But actually, the experience of an erection is also equal. Also, ejaculation. Yeah. Ejaculation. ejaculation. It's completely horrifying. It is. It, it, and and this I, is why this, I think the repression of masturbation is not the repression of the pleasure. Of the pleasure. pleasure. Yeah, it's a reactive 
action on the horrific fact that there is ejaculation. Yeah. You never will come to terms with this. Yeah, I mean, I've always, I mean, I remember as a child being fascinated by, like, the fact that a man or boys, you know, when you were a child, can't control their penis. And I remember yeah. we'd, like, be playing in the garden with a next-door neighbor boy who just walk around with, like, an erection. Mm-hmm. It was really weird. <laughs> It is yeah, funny when you live in... Yeah, she was hysterical. <laughs> yeah, okay. The funny thing is, I actually... All of the... Todd was saying I'm so obviously obsessive, but, like, um, I've... Uh, I've, uh, like, I think I've come to realise, like, a lot of my symptoms are so obvious. I actually just realised we were talking... I had this thing recently about plane crashes and getting really into, like... I have insomnia and like, I found that I can fall asleep if I watch documentaries about plane crashes and then it was just like watching people riding planes and it seems like that's very female like birthing inside I think and then you pointed out it's obviously to do with like giving birth and I've always thought that I really want children but then it's like giving birth is a plane crash it's yes. not maybe I don't maybe it's, 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 this is another question I want to ask you guys the thing about the symptom is like a reaction formation where there isn't an answer it's like two conflicting mm-hmm. desires mm-hmm. it's annoying uh-huh. and I actually you yeah, know it's annoying that works so well yeah yeah yeah, yeah. it's just like oh, that's <laughs> clever it's like damn but also you know I I was thinking about you know Peggy not Peggy Betty from Mad Men as like mm. a hysteric character I love Mad Men you know I think so of course I'm like quite like, Peggy ideas. also though Peggy also, Peggy also. Um, but you know the way like Betty dies and she's like kind of like really happy when she dies because she dies young and she's like not going to grow old you know and, like, yeah. um, that's the way her mom dies and you can see she's like really like there's something she gets out of it. But um, I noticed a lot. And she got fat. And then she, got she got fat then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, that it's preparing to die. Yeah. <laughs> but the, um, the co- when I was at college, there were a lot of women, and possibly myself, who got like chronic fatigue, which I really thought was like a response to, I don't know if it's being a woman in a kind of world which was it's a very like competitive university expected to work all the time and you know and it's like it's like Mm -hmm. a protest to that Mm -hmm. getting ill mysteriously and tired um and just i was thinking about like betty as a housewife and then potentially the hysteric in the world of work Mm -hmm. and how women fit in or Mm -hmm. not necessarily women but like a hysteric structure fits into a the into capitalism Mm -hmm. and how potentially as housewives you're alienated from it in a different way and Mm -hmm. you have a different set of symptoms but within it you have you have symptoms also also symptoms (laughs) maybe different ones housewife symptoms or you have (laughs) female worker female worker symptoms yeah and it's interesting that like things like chronic chronic fatigue I know a lot of men who've suffered from chronic fatigue but Mm -hmm. it's majoritarily women Mm -hmm. and uh yeah, I, don't know. I mean, you always point this out nicely that the I mean, hysteria does react to something that does exist. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, it's really, I mean, that sense is always indexed with something that you can find mm-hmm. in society. Mm-hmm. It's not a crazy invention mm-hmm. uh, of, of a problem. Mm-hmm. On the contrary. I mean, yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, Freud had this term neurasthenia which is basically Mm -hmm. chronic Mm -hmm. fatigue and 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 he thought of it as what like a post i mean it was it was a body that's that's stressed Mm -hmm. and stressed in a way in which the psyche and the unconscious can't even catch up with it Mm -hmm. and so Mm -hmm. like the it basically you could say that we're leaving no room for the life of the unconscious Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which means that there's too much stress and anxiety in the symptom yeah. and it just then it, it, it bottoms out and mm-hmm. it's speaking to the fact that we're not that we're, we as a society are taking the capacity to dream the capacity to fantasize mm-hmm. the capacity to have a relationship to our sexual bodies away from, yeah. from people by yeah. making them have to check their email 24-7 well, exa- this is exactly you know the, the world of work has changed so much and mm-hmm. it's so ubiquitous with 4G, 5G, or on your phone, yeah. you know, things like social media being a, a a good capitalist and promoting yourself in every aspect of everything you do, and how that, uh, yeah, what, what kind of symptoms will arise as, as a response to that? Have you noticed in your practice any kind of, for instance, social media? Social media seems like kind of a hysteric thing almost, <laughs> you know, there's selfies, you know. Yeah. Well, it always comes up, mm-hmm. and I, uh, I, I feel that I, I'm getting extremely annoyed with it, <laughs> and I can't hear another problem of a WhatsApp group that uh, <laughs> kind of did some terrible thing. 
so I haven't really come <laughs> to a point where I could say something intelligent about it. Yeah, yeah. I'm still myself in some kind of reaction yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, to it. I, I don't know. I think it needs more time to yeah. really... Yeah, I think, I think we don't know what's going to happen with the social media. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think people are at their limit with the dating apps. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, at the, and um, one of the things that I think the dating apps have brought out, and I, you can't say that this is for better or for worse, but is a kind of brutality um, in the experience of trying to find love. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I mean... It, it, maybe it was covered over before mm -hmm. because I don't know you would just get into the relationship mm -hmm. and it would feel spontaneous mm -hmm. and you would you know you could kind of hold on to it that mm -hmm. way but no one is able to hold on anymore mm -hmm. because the contingency of the app makes you think like on the one hand like oh I've met the love of my life on the other hand fuck it it's just one of a yeah. hundred people yeah. for the week yeah and the, this is really confusing because yeah. all of the fantasy is there, all of the desire is there, and all of the fact that these are two strangers, mm -hmm. two complete strangers with deep unconsciousness that's going to take a long time to figure mm -hmm. out whether they mesh at all, seems to be so present, mm -hmm. at, like almost immediately. Mm -hmm. And I think people are very, very hurt in this experience mm -hmm. somehow. So, you know, we went to a talk by Alan Berger. I don't know if you were there actually last year. Maybe it was a bit earlier than when I met you in LA, but he was talking about how Me Too hasn't gone far enough almost because the woman loses so much more in sex. And they're, there's almost like, the, so there's a, I guess culturally people think Me Too is a response to like patriarchal structures in the past and women are kind of overcoming and regaining something. But I think it's almost like, it's a contemporary thing and women are feeling, feeling traumatized now, yeah. you know, as in, I don't know what it is about sex, but it's sex is like really traumatic yeah. in a way that we don't like yeah. recognize. And that I don't know whether women are losing more or they have more to lose in this environment. Or they're experiencing it in it in, in an immediacy mm -hmm. that wasn't present before. Yeah. No, I think that that's a really important point, that Me Too isn't like, you know, the history of the struggle of women. It is that, mm -hmm. but that it's actually speaking to the fact that women feel really, really traumatized right now yeah. by the question of loving men. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Absolutely. And it's funny because, like, when you look at feminism in the 70s, and it was much more about, like women taking charge of their sexuality and like we want to be able to risk getting raped or mm -hmm. you know not having curfews at college or not okay. having to sign into a dorm whereas now the that aspect of feminism it's like almost the opposite yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. and it's a desire to be like Deeply looked protected. after yeah yeah, yeah. I mean there's a terrible a terrible contradiction in the yeah. two you know yeah, the yeah, dialectic yeah. that that, that it calls for the submission to some universal law of yeah. equality, yeah. which does not match with sexuality. Yeah. <laughs> so that, you know, you cannot apply human rights to sexuality. Exactly. And yeah. You can apply human rights to questions of violence and, yeah. and, and power, but yeah. not to sexuality. So yeah. Me Too is extremely conflicted because, yeah. of course, it's liberating and important, yeah. but it also means... We all just equal and all submitted to the same kind of, you know, yeah. universal and, law. And it, it, of, it, it's asking for more policing and it's asking policing, for um, more, rationalism. more rationalism and more morality. I mean, yeah. there's a, you know, there's a, this is a lot of feminists have pointed out the kind of moral sex panic that mm -hmm. it's introducing that they, they work so hard to fight yeah. against. Yeah. And I'm not anti me too, but I just, I think these contradictions are, are very, very yeah. palpable. And rather than like say it's good or say it's bad, mm -hmm. I think it's important to bring out your point, which is that it's speaking to an experience that women are having that yeah. they don't know what to do with. So it's almost like we have to analyze why me but too. But not just women, by the way. Yeah, men exactly. Too, men so. too. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Do you know, do you remember that commercial that came out from Gillette? Yeah. That was like pretty controversial. The, the, the toxic yeah, yeah, masculinity. The, Gillette, the toxic masculinity. Yeah. What was, I don't, I don't know. Oh, oh. it's like a B, uh, the best a man can get, which was the shaving mm -hmm. thing. The, they wanted it to be the best a man can be. Now. So it's all about like, oh, we used to be so terrible misogynists, and no, we now must be. But what you're talking about is just yeah. like being more conservative about it. There's a scene where there's a guy that looks at a woman that mm -hmm. walks across the street, and he's attracted to her, and he wants to talk to mm -hmm. her. 
And his friend that is next to him, yeah. he stops him to, yeah. from talking to yeah. her. I think he cat calls her. He like, you know, like, sh- sh- yeah, 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 whatever, yeah. You know, but it's like, I'm just wondering, it's like, what if they would have hit it off? <laughs> yeah, I know. It's like, they could have been like. friend is like, it, yeah. like, if there's virtue and just like, you know, don't even approach women. Uh, there's something also that I started to, this <laughs> don't even look at that. Don't, don't even look at that. I felt like, um, really insecure in around 2016, 2017, where I noticed it could be because I just suddenly got like a lot uglier, but like men weren't looking at me anymore. And I hated that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have I suddenly got these wrinkles? But I was just like, you know, as in, we can't deny, obviously. And again, I'm not against Me Too, but it's like, it's interesting to ask why Me Too is arising at this moment and what the implications are. And also that sex is violent mm-hmm. and which is, I guess, what Me Too is acknowledging, mm-hmm. but that that's not always, it's not even, I don't think the right mm-hmm. words to say it's not always a bad thing, but that's part of it, mm-hmm. you know? Um, and it, it's nice to be pursued by a man, you know? <laughs> well, this is, this is like, this is where it becomes very confusing for people. And I think people are in a place in which sex and violence are are imbricated in Mm -hmm. some way that they don't know how to get themselves out of. And I think by virtue of that, women are really terrified Mm -hmm. and men are terrified. Like we don't know when sex is something that we want or when sex becomes something violent. We don't know when someone's doing something to us that we like or Mm -hmm. when they're doing something to us that we think they shouldn't have done Mm -hmm. and they should be in really big trouble for it. And, you know, like they're trying to open up the conversation to try to have a conversation about it. But I see everybody drowning in this Mm -hmm. conversation. Mm -hmm. So I don't. um, And that doesn't mean that in breaking certain things open in the way that Me Too has and the way that hysteria kind of does force us into Mm -hmm. the chaos and the conundrum and the confusion. I, I, I hope but no analyst will ever make predictions. I hope we come out the other side of it with mm-hmm. a more interesting, a more complex way of thinking about human relationships, yeah. although the world doesn't look so great at the moment. No. And, and, and do you put it down to um, just a contingent situation? I mean, wh- do you, why do you think we're asking questions like this now? Post-60s yeah. revolution. My, my, yeah. I have like you a have speculative, been, yeah. crazy idea is that it is what is on the horizon is non-sexual reproduction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love yeah, this. Yeah. I love this speculation. And yeah. I, I think we feel this. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, sexuality would go mm-hmm. wild. Yeah. Or get completely policed. Mm-hmm. Or become maybe creative. Mm-hmm. We don't know. Mm-hmm. When it gets even more dissociated mm-hmm. from the question of, of reproduction than it already is. Yeah. And it is going to happen. Yeah. I mean, this is really mm-hmm. science fiction, but I mean, this it, yeah. it is going yeah, it's to happen. happen yeah. They made the womb. So they, they, made yeah, the womb. Yeah, yeah. They, made the, they made the outside the woman body, yeah. woman's body mm-hmm. womb. Yeah. There's also, I mean, I guess, you know, obviously things like the pill uh, changing the nature mm-hmm. of what sex is yeah. for a woman. Yeah. Um, and I guess things, yeah. I mean, the, 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 the book by Preciado, Testo Junkie, mm-hmm. which talks about, um, you know, this is the first auto theory, but her... She says that hormones are the first mass-produced bodily substance mm-hmm. that's distributed, and she links this to Fordism, and mm-hmm. then she's using kind of Foucauldian ideas. She is a he now, so he. But mm-hmm. when, she, when the book was written, it was by Beatrice, not Paul. Mm-hmm. Um, he links it also to uh, Foucault and the idea that, you know, in biopolitics, like mm-hmm. it's not this regime, this police that says, like, stop doing this, that, that the way in which they police us mm-hmm. is by taking us over from the inside, that, mm-hmm. that it's a manipulation of our body. So um, certainly I think there's something really interesting mm-hmm. about the question of the pill, which is supposed to be an undisputed good, and no one's going to argue against the idea of taking control of your reproduction, but that doesn't mean that, that any technology is just good. All yeah, technologies yeah. we know are a double-edged sword. Mm-hmm. So this dissociation that which Marcus is pointing to between sex reproduction and reproduction and like that we don't know what to do this is very very confusing yeah yeah and I mean my the women that I see in my practice have no idea how to have babies they don't know how to 
want to do it they try to find the things like well now i'm 35 so i guess i should do it and my doctor says no 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 and they're using all of these things to try to make sense of it Mm -hmm. or okay well we've been in a relationship for five years i mean like Mm -hmm. like we don't they're so confused yeah what is going to make this desire something concrete and real in the world and why this person and not that person and how do i know it's like there's no this is a this is a this is quicksand yeah absolutely i mean it's a yeah, I mean, it's life and death and we have mm-hmm. control over it mm-hmm. in a way that we haven't had before. Yeah, yeah, I think that Patricia Garavici talks about this, that the hysterical symptoms are more life and death than they mm-hmm. used to be, which isn't to say that they weren't life and death, mm-hmm. but the life and death questions are more evident in mm-hmm. them and mm-hmm. more real. So yeah. that, and she talks about that as a yeah. quality of the real yeah. in the symptom that's like really, really close to the surface. Yeah. Um, which she does this work with trans people. So she's saying, you know, here you see where the hysterical question about the body and Mm -hmm. gender, like, you know, they have this suicide rate that's like 57% higher than anybody else because of that life and death nature of the hysterical symptoms. Well, this is because, you know, in in the wider world, often you hear, well, that's because... And I'm not to say that, you know, there isn't a huge amount of transphobia and, you know, these kinds of problems, but in in the way that kind of a more kind of like rationality approach is oh the suicide always because of bullying or something but actually these are life and death questions and questions revolving around you know we're talking potentially like his um neurotic questions mm-hmm. and never being able to find mm-hmm. a delineation mm-hmm. and yeah yeah no but i mean the bullying comes because it's just too hard to ask and confront this person who's putting this in your face. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. I mean, and then like, the really good psychoanalysts who write about um, violence towards mm-hmm. trans people, mm-hmm. you know, understand that that that, yeah. that, that, that that the trans person is really overstimulating, really exciting, yeah. really confusing, really terrifying. Because we were talking about, you know, like sex being really actually horrifying. We actually just made like a short film about this, that actually the reality of sex itself is like this horrific almost sci-fi horror thing that actually if you see and almost like rape is sex without fantasy almost Mm -hmm. and so post 68 you know and not to throw out 68 as such but like one of the downsides has been sex in the public realm and it is very traumatizing Mm -hmm. you know and it's true that that that, that, you know because it's questions of also i mean this is another thing that i've noticed about um identities and sex that often like an individual fetish is turned into like a like a, a sexual identity mm-hmm. so like i don't know, like pansexual or something mm-hmm. or like attracted to it and inanimate objects but it's like something that we would have kept quiet or just repressed as like a fantasy is now like an actual public identity that a lot of people wear on their sleeves it's a whatsapp group that then marcus has to hear about yeah yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. One one of the one of the many I think uh, virtues of the Oedipus, mm-hmm. uh, you know, fantasy or myth or mm-hmm. structure, complex uh, and and uh, uh, is that that it um, puts on the table the question of uh, the relation to the parents. Mm-hmm. I mean, it sounds very simple. Mm-hmm. But this is actually gets obliterated in the horizontal presence of sex. Yeah, yeah. As if it were not fundamentally a life and death relation to the generation preceding. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, it's not only sleeping with the mother, it's also killing the father. Yeah. And it's also, uh, you know, there's also a matricidal fantasy probably yeah. very uh, prevalent mm-hmm. so there's something the violence of sex is not only in the act of the copulation mm-hmm. there's also a violence of being born yeah yeah, it's, yeah. You know, in itself a killing of uh, uh, the, the preceding generation reproduced yeah. in the sex so what you reproduce in your own sex is the killing that you committed by being born and in the fantasy yeah like, just yeah. Uh, it's the same and, and it's just like alien with it bursting out of you again yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, and some of the, the you know is another dialectic that the you know the presence of sex is actually also an uh, obliteration of the violence at heart of you know the, the parent child mm-hmm, mm-hmm, relationship. Mm-hmm. It does does not get talked about yeah, at all. You yeah. know, so and then it occurs as phenomena like you know infanticide and you know yeah. crazy family stories. Yeah, and, yeah, know, yeah. Rape in the family. Yeah. As if 
those were isolated phenomena. Yeah. I don't think they are no. in disease of, of phantasmatic structures yeah. and real structures. I mean, or what is you know BDSM then like a kind of crazy version of maternal care? Yeah, no, it, you know, exactly. Wrapping the person up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but it's funny because it becomes an identity, or it becomes yeah. a conversion, or it becomes all these other things. Yeah. And I think I think this is right. The kind of parental issues that at stake are kind of suppressed, which is why yeah. psychoanalysis is good for bringing us back to these very basic things. Have you guys seen this practice that people do where they get they want to get wrapped up in a blanket and they they tie a knot in it and they just feel kind of like in the womb? Is it, would you say then that that's like maybe like a BDSM thing but without the leather and without the... <laughs> <laughs> you know what it reminds me of Temple Grandin? Do you, uh, yeah, do you know yeah, the autistic, the, autistic, well, the, ho- the hug the machine. The hugging machine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Machine. yeah. There's, a, there's also you can buy like weighted blankets now that like have a hundred. I have away. one. I bought. I it. want to buy one. Yeah. It's a good anxiety. It's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just feels like it's full of sand. You're, is like, it? you're like in a tomb. Yeah. Well, yeah. this we were talking about the womb I'm tomb like idea. Antigone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Antigone in bed in my sand blanket. It's disgusting. <laughs> so we've gone pretty far from home. But any last remarks on the film that you guys might might have? Do you want to? I I talked about it. What do you think of the Cassavetes? I mean, I it's a long time that I have seen it. Yeah. Uh, I think there must be something. Uh, what if I watched it again now yeah. after the conversation? Yeah. There's something about the relation between the hysteria that is being represented through this woman and the improvisation. Mm-hmm. Of the movie. Yeah, absolutely. I would now yeah. look for mm-hmm. that. You know what? How hysteric is this as a mm-hmm. way of making movies? Yeah. Yeah. In rela- which was in yeah. relation to the industry yeah. and how productive. That is. There's one and Cassavetes. I mean, I don't know if you know, mm-hmm. but I mean, it, this was like he created this family. He mm-hmm. created almost this commune, and he was acting in order to fund this these amazing films. Mm-hmm. And I mean, he's still, I think, for filmmakers, someone who did like the unimaginable. Yeah, absolutely. In terms of the capacity to produce these films, and and you kind of imagine that 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 was the only moment in which it could be done. Mm-hmm. It's like you know, like whatever cusp yeah. the film industry was on, only he could have done it at that moment Mm -hmm. and this is impossible now to create that kind of collective to hide the money away to do it also without it being Mm co-opted because no one like you know he he just did these and no one really watched them and he kept going Mm -hmm. and nowadays it would turn into some stupid thing on the internet yeah exactly exactly except for this mexican film which one this 10 hour mexican film oh yeah marcus uh, has a and you know, and I don't, I don't recall the names, it, but it's out there, and yeah. you'll find it. it's now spoken about, yeah. which probably also in the long run will get highly commercialized. Yeah. But there's something about Do you the. You know what he's talking about? I know. No, 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 it's not Mexican. It's Argentinian. Argentinian, uh, yeah. It's an Argentinian uh, group of uh, um, a filmmaker and actors, uh-huh. and they've been doing this for ten years, and it's oh, a movie really? really about nothing but yeah. just acting. You know, yeah. about mm-hmm. them acting, yeah. and uh, it's quite um, it's quite unique. So there are yeah. pockets where this. But there's one type of film, film. also where it's the acting and life, the mm-hmm. soldering yeah. of that together, which really is hysterical. Mm-hmm. And what do they oh, say yeah. about hysterics? Oh, she's just acting, but she's not, not acting. acting. Yeah. But it doesn't mean that life doesn't have a performative mm-hmm. quality in which your performance draws somebody in in a very real way. Mm-hmm. So. This is where the question of theater and hysteria kind of meld, I think, in, in the film world. And that's, you know, maybe what Cassavetes uh, tapped into mm-hmm. in that way. Woman Under the Influence is maybe the one that kind of stands out. Mm-hmm. I mean, although she, Gina was in so many so of his films. Mm-hmm. Oh, she's great. She's, she's so, good. so unbelievable. I was going to say, there's one type of film that is commercially made that are often improvised or semi-improvised, which is horror movies. I don't know if horror has something hysterical about it. It's a lot to do with life, death, birth. Um, oh, absolutely! I have like my hysterical yeah. patients are some of the ones who who like sit and watch horror mm-hmm. movies because it's disguised sexual excitement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So like, <laughs> oh my god, it's so scary! You know? yeah. and, like this is like all of their sexual excitement, yeah. and I I only realized this because I saw teenagers in line for. Um, 
you know, like whatever roller coaster. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they're like, how scary do you think it's going to be? Oh, it's going to be so scary. Oh, I was on it last week. It was so scary. Oh my God, how scary is it? You know, and like, and I was listening yeah, to yeah. I was like, this is, this is just sex talk. Like, you yeah. guys are like, you guys are like talking about the sex yeah, that you're yeah. about to have or the sex that you just had and like, how good was it or how bad was yeah. it? Or But there's something very like maternal, I think, about all the elements of horror. And I used to have nightmares about, I said like, bears in a cupboard and sharks all these things they, they see like there's the mother that's going to gobble you up into oblivion yeah. you know yeah. um, they always have like no I love my mother but no <laughs> for bearing mother <laughs> if you have to say it well. I don't know I don't know who knows I don't know anything but the, and the horror movie sets up a situation where the limits always have to be crossed so mm-hmm. you know you, you see yes. that once you get the rules like okay so the, if you're blah 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 then the ghost isn't going to go in mm-hmm. there and then the next movie is like nope yeah and so like it keeps setting up a boundary that then mm-hmm. the next yes. movie has to, to break yeah right? mm-hmm. Very interesting. We should do more horror movies, but I'm always too scared to watch horror movies. I just can't bear them. Did you watch Hereditary? I did, Hereditary. yeah. Oh, God, it took me like five days to recover from that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so you didn't watch, watch. Oh, God, I watched. Watch. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it really ups the ante. I mean, yeah. that moment when that when the mother chops her own head oh, off, I mean, it's just like, I, you can't even believe that the movie <laughs> yeah. went there. You were just like. What, hey, talking about, what did you think about Suspiria? Did you watch it, the new one? It's, this is the Tilda Swinton dancing mm, yeah, movie. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I thought that was great. Mm-hmm. I, um, it was so good. But I had to work out of that. It was just too... The, the, the final scene. Yeah. I mean, that, like, went... I mean, I was less interested in that scene mm-hmm. because it was, like, it just, like, it, it just went over the top with the gore mm-hmm. and the whatever. Yeah. I the, the scene in which she dances mm-hmm. and the dancing breaks her body into, yeah, like, yeah, a million yeah. pieces. Yeah. I mean, this is, like, the most incredible hysterical yeah. horror scene. Um, you know, and they're using a kind of peanut. I'm explaining this to Marcus. Mm. You guys can't see me. Um, <laughs> the, the it's like playing off of Pina Bausch, just this incredibly histrionic mm-hmm. form of dance. But then it becomes the thing that like, what are you like, what are you doing to your body? And that's a very hysterical mm-hmm. question. Mm-hmm. Like, am I doing something beautiful and creative, or am I doing something completely destructive and not knowing? Yeah. Yeah. We just made a video where it's kind of a Pina esque dance, dance, and one of the male dancers starts to like extract himself from the dance and fall through the floor into like another world. But uh, and the yeah. rest of the dancers start ascending. Start so. ascending somewhere else. <laughs> So right. It's fun what you can do in music video. <laughs> Nonsense. <laughs> All right, so we hit the, the hour mark. Thank you so much for, Thank for you joining so much. us. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. It's really right. interesting. Bye. Bye.